Okay, so just let me know in full chat. Okay, so we can start the meeting. Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome back to Saturday Club meeting. Uh, today we have uh, Dr. Manoj Yadav, uh, who had been our guest speaker many times in the past also, so hardly requires any require, uh, any introduction. He's a consultant pulmonologist practicing in Vadodara for more than 22 years. He had his initial training at KEM Hospital, Mumbai, and he is founder president of Association of Chase Physicians of Vadodara. He had plenty of paper presentations at national and international conferences and won awards also. So today he will be talking to about uh, talking to us about uh, biologics in severe asthma, a very interesting topic, and uh, we look forward to very informative talk from Dr. Manoj Yadav. Dr. Manoj, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, I am glad to present uh, in front of this august audience and with whom I have been having association since a long time, and uh, I thank Dr. Satish sir for uh, giving me this opportunity to talk on a talk this biologic in severe asthma. Uh, my apologies for the problem, technical problems. I will not be able to put the on slide show. So here's the second slide. So I think asthma doesn't require too much of uh, introduction to the, the audience here. Everybody knows what is asthma. So I'll just briefly say, if you want to understand asthma, earlier it was considered as a single entity, which is not now absolute theory, right? So earlier it was supposed, uh, it was seen as an excessive T helper cell type 2 cell response in a specific IgE driving airway hyper responsiveness, which conveys the dominant mechanism of allergic asthma. But now we understand it as an umbrella diagnosis for a collection of several distinct diseases where endotypes like T2 high and T2 low are being considered and varying phenotypes, young atopic, obese, middle aged, and elderly, and etc. All of these manifest with symptoms of wheezing and shortness of breath to cough and chest tightness. So these are the presentation and are accompanied by variable airflow obstruction. So when we talk about disease endotype, any disease endotypes will have anatomical factors, remodel resident cells, which again is affected by genetic and epigenetic factors, innate and adaptive immune responses, psychological factors, metabolic pathways, nutrition, microbiome, uh, exposome, epithelial barriers. All these three factors will lead to defining a disease endotype. Right? So earlier, asthma, as we said, was a broad term for all patients having tough breathlessness. Now we know that we have got eosinophilic and non-eosinophilic asthma, childhood onset, adult onset asthma. A large portion of these are allergic asthma still, but some now we can diagnose as say occupational asthma, then cough variant asthma, aspirin exacerbated asthma, intrinsic asthma, patient with obesity having asthma, occupational asthma, and so forth and so forth. Right? What is phenotype? So phenotype is an observable characteristic like obesity, a smoker, atopic, non-atopic, etc., with no direct relation to the disease process, including the physiology, triggers, and inflammatory parameters. And what is endotype? It is a distinct disease entities which may be present in a cluster of the phenotypes, but each defined by a specific biological mechanism. In asthma, when we talk of endotype and phenotypes of asthma, so we have T2 high and T2 non-T2 endotypes, as you can see in this table. Then we have phenotypes, atopic, late onset, and aspirin as a respiratory disease. In atopic, we have well-defined early onset, which are steroid sensitive, late onset, which is competent CISWNP and steroid refractory. And in aspirin, exacerbated respiratory disease, it is adult onset, right? So some of these are actually steroid responsive. Some are not, especially non-T2. In non-T2, we are non-atopic, then smokers having asthma, obesity related, and elderly patients, right? So these patients are usually steroid resistant, as you can see here, steroid resistant, right? Here, more frequent exacerbation in smokers, in obesity, it is severe symptoms, but with a preserved lung function, right? The GINA guidelines have been modified recently to include low-dose ICS and formatol as a first-line therapy in asthma management, which was not earlier. 
without going into the details we'll go to the severe asthma management that is in step 5 where the patient having severe symptoms requiring high dose of ics lava steroids other drugs they will be labeled they will be clubbed into step 5 and they may require tiotropium then biologics which is the topic of today discussion so what is difficult asthma and what is severe asthma so all severe asthma patients actually should be labeled as difficult to treat asthma before we label it as severe asthma a difficult asthma is one which is uncontrolled asthma with poor symptom control frequent severe exacerbations of more than two courses of systemic corticosteroids requiring in the last year and these steroids can be given either on the opd basis or on admission then serious exacerbation like more than one hospitalization or icu stay and air for rehabilitation where the fe1 is less than 80% and fe1 per fe is less than ln that is lower limit of normal and they require high dose of ics and lava and they require steroids more than 50% of the previous year right any of these thing will be this patients are actually goes in the definition of more difficult asthma severe asthma so what is the differentiation so we need to label a patient as severe asthma after we have excluded all the other factors which are causing the asthma to be controlled or we are having difficulty in controlling like adherence in other technique triggers and comorbidities so before we move ahead i'll just present a small case and then we'll again go back to the theory so here is a 51 year old male who has a 25 year history of asthma with a family history of asthma he owns a engineering factory and there's no on the workplace no chemical exposure no chemical factories although there are a lot of greenery and he presented long back to me with cough and cold over the years he had been on ics lava and all sorts of medications including for anti fungals as you can see right anti fungals for chronic sinusitis and he said he had subject to improvement when itraconazole was given right for more than two months right but when itraconazole was stopped i uh, was given the no need of steroid was decreased so he was behaving possibly like the abpa the asthma medication which was given from 2006 to 2013 included ics lava moderate to high dose ics montelukast antihistamines theophylline off and on oral steroids prednisone that is 5 to 15 days of course course every 3 to 4 months especially in the last 5 6 years so overall he had acid and grd which was again treated again and he had a very hectic life he used to be out of borora out of india actually for a long time always traveling the good thing was most of the places he was not having any problem except for damp and humid climates so his asthma control was poor quality of life uh, if you could discuss he did not require admission but he was never uh like he was always out of breath uh, every 2 to 3 months and out of energy right and uh, his peak flow had decreased from 200 to 300 and dipped to around 150 during exacerbations he had ronchi whenever he used to be in exacerbation and sometimes even when he was asymptomatic there were few ronchi on post excretion otherwise the chest was clear he had hyperpigmented lesions over the right elbow his eosinophil fills one of the report was showing 13% otherwise it was always above 5% and going up to 20% ig was around 600 chest x ray and ct scan was normal he got his allergy test done at three different laboratories and none matched with the each other so emphasizes the point that allergy reports may not work may not be so much of help as if they may have been uh, promoted the baseline fe1 showed severe obstruction with fe1 of 40% and fe2 of 78% right and no significant reversibility was seen on that side okay. so what do we do now so first in such cases who are not uh, getting better with all our medicines all the masala all the drugs possible which you can give we need to check for the inhaler technique in this patient it was good then we should look for comorbidities i'll discuss in the next slide and they need to optimize the ocs sometimes we stop the oral corticosteroids too fast and so sometimes we may require a little more and we should consider newer therapies especially in patients who are repeating who are needing repeated ocs dose so what are the comorbidities in a asthma patient which we should look for these are hyperventilation glottic dysfunction psychopathologies smoking if there is present copd respiratory infections other conditions like atopic dermatitis abpa bronchiectasis hormonal disturbance uh, osa obesity gerd chronic sinusitis and allergic Non-allergic and polypoid rhinitis. So in most of the asthma patients, like nearly 70-80% will have upper respiratory like rhinitis, sinusitis. Most of them will also have GERD. These two are very common in asthma patients, and we should look for them. Especially in females, we should look for hyperventilation and glottic dysfunction. 
and obese patients again gerd will be there and obesity will be there so moving ahead to our patient so in 2013 i asked him to take the opinion of my sir dr ashok bashu uh, sir and he advised omalizumab which was uh, which was just introduced a couple of years before that the patient refused and he was considered on the same treatment right and in 2018 finally he was ready for omalizumab and we gave him as per the weight and the ige omalizumab has to be given as per the weight of the patient and the ige levels so he was given 300 mg twice a month to injection he felt significant improvement initially right so feeling of well being no need of steroids but also felt the beneficial effects were not long lasting and went off after 10 to 12 days the lab report showed from 14 5 to 18 to over a year that there are hardly any change in any of the parameters whether it is ige or use no fills right all the patient felt a bit better so a question arises what is the factor which decides the exacerbation ige or eosinophils so all the studies have shown that it is the eosinophil which detects which decides the risk of exacerbation and ig doesn't so we have seen patients having ig of whether 1000 or 10000 15000 25000 but they may not be having severe asthma but the patients having asthma and having high eosinophil count are having repeated exacerbations okay so these are the studies which show that exacerbations are and poor asthma control are correlated so in 2019 uh, after completing after giving omalizumab for 12 months uh, he was having literally the same spirometry findings and in 2019 there was a new drug mepolizumab which is anti il5 it was started and it was given once a month he improved much more than he was on omalizumab when he was on omalizumab and ics lava has decreased by itself for a few months and then again i had to ask him you continue this but he stopped montelukast and antihistamines no theophylax no need of oral corticosteroids was required apart from the good asthma control he had a decrease in the size of the hyperpigmented lesion absence of skin lesions on the lower limbs and improvement in other skin lesions that the atopic dermatitis the lab report showed that the eosinophil count with a 17% right had decreased to 3% after about 4 months and after another nearly 9 months or so it had gone to 0.3 so and this was around the start of the pandemic okay so this is a bit more detail so during 2020 uh, early lockdown he missed two doses of mepolizumab mepolizumab has to be given every month and after so he needed a five dose of five days of low dose steroid at sixth week of missed dose and he restarted on mepolizumab and was feeling better a year later in 2021 his spirometry was done he was already on mepolizumab that time regularly every month and he did not show much improvement in the spirometry so despite that mepolizumab was given and he had a fun- family function and he said ki i am worried if i may have a problem so okay i said take a steroid for 4 5 days or 2 3 days so he took prednisolone 5 mg twice a day for 2 days with this low dose of oral corticosteroid also he reported feeling very much energetic and he was danced to every discipline even he was not able to uh, he was happy that he got such a good endurance he, after the marriage he came back to me discuss the uh, this his observation and i discussed this with on a scientific platform with experts and it was opined that possibly this patient needs additional dose of uh, mepolizumab uh, or benalizumab again was a new drug which was again coming and it was suggested either we switch or to that the difference between mepo and benalizumab is benalizumab causes rapid and near complete depletion of the eosinophils so he was given benalizumab 30 mg per day and he improved dramatically and not only that clinically his eosinophil counts which was 5.1% on day 1 of benalizumab decreased to 0% just 5 days before the second dose so within 2 months they have gone down to zero and his f peak flow meters readings had improved right so coming to some discussion on difficult to treat versus severe asthma again so any patient with having debilitating asthma we need to see if he is not getting better whether the symptoms are due to asthma or because of asthmatic with other causes or patients non asthmatic but having respiratory symptoms and these are the things we need to see we already discussed so these patients this group of patients will be labeled as difficult asthma and here these patients will be severe asthma will label after we have 
seen that the adherence and inner technique is okay and other diseases have been taken care of and severe asthma case we need to see go for biologic therapies and other add on therapies why severe asthma is important severe asthma is actually just 10% of all the asthmatics out of 10% only 10 of uh, all the asthma patients only 10% of severe asthma however they require a large resources they have require high dose of ics and laba and other drugs and up to 70% of these patients with severe asthma are eosinophilic from the patient's perspective they have a substantial burden caused by symptom exacerbations medication side medication side effects interference with day to day living sleeping and physical activity frightening unpredictable flare ups a person who has asthma will know they are just out of breath they just can't breathe right and for hospitals or for governments who are paying for the patients like in the western countries so although it is 10% the 50% of resources go into managing this 10% of the cases these patients are 15 times more emergency care use and 20 times more hospital admissions so what are the biological uh, what are the biomarkers to know severe asthma one is ige then we have got blood eosinophils usputum eosinophils and pheno in most of the cases we regularly do blood eosinophils and we can very well rely on the reports from the laboratories most of the laboratories but again i have a word of caution some of the laboratories over a period of so many years i have seen if the patient is repeating the reports there and they are normal the eosinophils they are reporting it as 2% or 1% and the moment they change the lab actually a couple of patients i have seen that the report actual report which is coincide which is comparable to the or we can say correlated with the disease the eosinophil count is shown to be high 5% 6% right so if the patient is having asthma if the eosinophils are coming normal i would always suggest to change the lab once at least okay so this already not required this i have already discussed the relation of blood eosinophils with asthma severity and control so the eosinophils the higher the eosinophils the more the risk of severe exacerbations acute respiratory events and overall asthma control is poorer and the patient's eosinophil count is high we know that in asthma the most immediate treatment which can be given right from a jhola chap doctor to any specialist is steroids to save the patient's life steroids has to be given but once in a while is okay but patients with severe asthma require repeated ocs and what is the call what is the side effects everybody knows that so just to recollect hypertension cardiovascular disease metabolic disorders psychiatric disorders cataract dyslipidemia osteoporosis all these are the side effects of repeated ocas and we know the 93% of patients with severe asthma will have taken at least one ocs will have at least one ocs related side effect and even four bursts per year of ocs is associated with specific adverse effects right just four so you give uh, every 3 to 4 with every change of season you give uh, steroids right and even i used to give the patients steroids ki bhai theek hai diwali aa rahi you take steroids season is changing you take steroids four five days but everything has a side effects especially with repeated use and the ers task force has defined that major criteria to identify severe ischemic asthma that is a diagnosis of severe asthma persistent blood or sputum eosinophilia frequent exacerbations and need for intermittent or continuous ocs to achieve asthma control and my next criteria is late onset of disease chronic rhinitis and disease often with nasal polyposis biomarkers are positive fixed airway obstruction is there and air trapping and mucus plugging the key point is the asthma patient with elevated peripheral blood eosinophils can present with atopy or maybe non atopy or as determined by standard diagnostic methods this is a slide where it shows the triggers and the severe issues i will not go into this okay so coming to the earlier patient uh, i think i missed a slide there keep to keep a slide so that patient has received bendolizumab for about 6 months that is four doses i'll coming to those and he was totally okay not requiring biologics for over a year uh, for over 6 months and again he had some symptoms and he took another two doses coming to another case who which we often see is a steroid dependent asthmatic like steroid dependent asthma patient it is a case right? 17 year old male retired from the defense sector known case of asthma since 50 years ex smoker he quit 10 years back and he has been on inhaler since 20 years very regular on treatment with inhalers and oral medications since the last 3 and 3.5 years 3 and 1/2 years uh, so 
I need to you, you all to see that he's been on oral medications, including steroids. So this is the treatment with which he came to me. So as you can see, this is a very irrational prescription, I would say, because he's on nebulizer four times a day. Foracot nebulizer SOS actually it should be the reverse. Foracot by the uh, doctor who was treating him, but this is the actual prescription. He is in Foracot Rotacab twice a day, Astaline tablet twice a day, Doxalin 400 milligram, the Doxophilin twice a day, Esbrofalin 200 OD, then Montelukast with Levocetrazin and Alaspan, right, the Loratidine uh, and uh, Metrol, that is solid uh, injection, a tablet methylprednisone, 4 milligrams for last three and a half years. He is already on Amlopin, Moxilog, Zepi, Vicozin, and liquid, this D3 nano 60, that is vitamin D3, that too for last six months. So this was a very irrational prescription and the patient was never referred to a pulmonologist or any higher center. So how do we approach the case? How did I approach the case? We discussed the side effects of steroids in the patient and the potential exacerbations on decreasing the dose of steroids. We also discussed the availability of new drugs, that is biologics. And his concern was, will biologics be needed forever? So ideally it is, but my approach is more practical. What I ask the patient is, you take biologics, get proper control of asthma with pulmonary rehabilitation, dietary modification, identify the allergies and avoid them. And possibly after six months, we may not require. And this has happened in most of my patients. So the patient still uh, agreed, he steroids are tapered and he had some weakness off and on with pulmonary rehabilitation rehab and cardiac treatment was ongoing and he improved. Right? So this is the first case which I showed. I'll just skip to the last slide. This is the lab reports. Yeah, so actually I have to the slide here. So his eosinophil count decreased and six months after his last dose, uh, I, I, I think uh, this was 25 weeks. That is nearly four months after the last dose of benzodiazepam, that patient had eosinophils which increased and we had to give benzodiazepam again. Yes. Sorry, the, this the mixed up. So finally, Benazir was given and we'll monitor the blood use of things. Okay, this is the FEC FE1. So the this is of the first case, not the second. This is of the young, the businessman, right? So lung functions has improved. The FE1 is just 55%, that is 1.64, improved to 1.98, then 2.19, and again 2. Okay, at this in May, we started Brandlizumab again, it is much better. There are other cases. Uh, I'll just take 10 minutes to discuss that and some theory again. This is another case with some non-conventional indication. He's again a 49-year-old male with, again, ICS, lava, Montelukast, antistems being given, oral steroids on and off two to four times a day, uh, for a week, year, two to four times in a year for three to five years. He has gone to all chest physicians in Vadodara, Mumbai, Ahmedabad. His use levels have always been high. IG is always more than 1,000, PFT showing severe obstruction always. However, despite aggressive treatment, for a few months, he was not taking his medications because he's a gen and he used to fast alternate day. And he had pollution last year. And that time he was worried that he may be need to get admitted because of asthma exhibition. So I discussed the case, opted for biologics. The moment he gave, gave biologics, his peak activity flow improved from 110 on day one to 190 on day four. That was a fantastic improvement, right? And this patient was not given any steroid, either IV or oral, right? And so this is a fantastic response. After the second dose, the peak flow was 250 to 300. And after the fourth dose, that is at fifth month, it was 375. This is a huge improvement. And for the patient, it is a huge relief. So he took for six months after that, he stopped for six months, he was okay. And then again, he required two doses. This is his serum IgE and eosinophil levels. As you can see from 9.8, sorry, from 16%, it has decreased to zero. And again, in March, sorry, April this year, it has increased to 11.9. And that is after four to five months of the last dose. Another case, this is a variety of cases. This lady, uh, had asthma since about 20 years and on high dose ICS lava, he was still not taking steroids despite her exacerbations because of her obesity. Right? So she agreed for biologics and again 
had good improvement, but not as good as the other patients. The reason was that despite telling her to avoid any pollution, she exposed herself to the cement dust during renovation at her house. And also, she was not following the dietary advice. I like to tell you that, as I discussed earlier, these patients have GERD. And microaspiration is a common cause of repeated asthma exacerbations. So we need to have proper G GRD treatment also in all these cases. So this patient had one exacerbation, but after that, she was better. When she came for the second dose, the husband was a little agitated. He said, mehengi dawai likhwa diye, to kuch karti nahi hai. और कुछ होने भी नहीं वाला इससे सब ट्रीटमेंट कर लिया सब डॉक्टरों को दिखा दिया बट व्हेन द डे शी वाज गिवन द इंजेक्शन राइट दैट डे दे वेंट टू द बस स्टॉप सॉरी बस स्टेशन टू कैच अ बस एंड दिस जेंटलमैन कुड नॉट गो एंड वॉक अराउंड द बस स्टैंड टू सर्च फॉर द बस राइट एंड दिस लेडी डिस्पाइट हर वेट ओवर वेट शी रैन अराउंड फॉर द बस they could not get a bus to their destination so they came back to the hospital for overnight stay and that time the husband's uh, attitude had changed he was visibly happy that his wife was able to move around and her endurance physical endurance had improved this lady has again taken four injections sorry five injections and then has not opted because of the cost but she is better than what she was about a year back again this lady similar case she had taken omolism of six months back she is a 50 year old lady and owner of a corrugated box making factory in wapi she had chronic cough and repeated exacerbations on and off uh, admission the good thing or the interesting thing about this lady was that she was referred by the first case gentleman and this is a case who said ki manoj bhai mane bataiye tum biologic aap hi do i don't want to wait for your uh, aggressive treatment or admission and all those stuff so we gave biologic there is benadism up and her eosinophil uh, sorry her peak flow and pft improved and uh, she was able to go to palitana and other places which has tested the physical endurance and again she is able to climb three floors by stairs which she was not able to do earlier she is not required she is not followed up I for didn't time. understand that she is not followed up for number of 6 months but telephonic consult uh, telephonic talk we we had a telephone call and she is much better so when a patient is a ocs we cannot decrease it directly when even if you are giving uh, biologics or any other treatment okay so we need to follow this so following short term treatment we can stop following long term treatment abrupt withdrawal can lead to adrenal insufficiency or death so basal morning serum cortisol should be done which we did in the gentleman who was having uh, was on steroid dependent and then we have to gradually withdraw this slide i have uh, put so that anybody should not think that when we give biologics we should stop the steroids abruptly oh, so so coming to the biologics which are available in india so we have omolizumab mepolizumab and benalizumab omolizumab is indicated for moderate to severe persistent asthma asthma uncontrolled by ics in patients with age than more than 12 years the dose is dependent on the i the weight of the patient and the ige levels and it can be given 2 to 4 weekly right and it has to be given uh, the side effects can be uh, some reaction and dermatological neuromuscular effect they have been reported in mepolizumab it is an add on maintenance for severe asthma in patients more than 18 years and 100 mg sub q is given every month that is 4 weekly benalizumab it is an add on maintenance for severe asthma severe eosinophilic asthma in patients more than 18 years and it is 30 mg sub q the first three doses has to be given every four weeks and then it has to be given every two months that is eight weekly so first six months there will be four doses and after that there will be only three doses that is on the alternate month overall the side effects of benalizumab and mepolizumab are comparable right and overall they are well tolerated in clinical trials and even in my clinical practice like in i have given mepolizumab in three patients Uh, omolizumab again in three patients and benalizumab i have given in seven patients and they will be very well tolerated what is the difference in mepolizumab and benalizumab so mepolizumab will cause passive eosinophilic apoptosis so all the eosinophils may not go away there may be some remaining when we talk of some remaining that means that even if the eosinophil counts decreases significantly in the blood stream they may still be there in the tissue 
and they may lead to non control of asthma patients when you talk of venlafaxine there is an enhanced antibody dependent cell mediated cytotoxicity which leads to active eosinophil apoptosis and near total depletion of the eosinophils and that leads to rapid control okay so venlafaxine it causes near complete depletion of eosinophils right the zero blood eosinophils the reduced median peripheral blood eosinophil counts by 100% at day 1 as compared to 0% reduction in the placebo arm and this 96% depletion overall right in the mucosa and mucosal and cervical airway mucosa and cervical eosinophils right okay at day 84 but this explains the immediate and fantastic response of benzodiazepine okay so i'll just go to a few slides Okay. There are various studies like for benzodiazepine, this Kalima and Sirocco, for ben meprazolam, this Dream, Mensa, Mensa, and for Romulizumab, you know. I'm not going to the details. All of them, of course, are favoring the disease uh, for the use of the drugs. And there's no point in discussing them. Only one benzodiazepine pile discussed that the exacerbation rates in all the trials, which show that the exacerbation had decreased by 85 percent, and among patients with more than three exacerbations in baseline, 52 percent were Exacerbation free at 48 weeks. As far as OCS dependency is concerned, there was 51% steroid free patients. 65% of all patients reduced the OCS doses by more than 50%. So in 65%, more than 50%. In 51%, they were steroid free. And patient reported outcome: the patients were seen. Uh, the clinical improvement was there in ACQ6 and AQLQ. Uh, plus 12 was seen in 58% 60% of patients respectively the improvements observed at day at week 16 and maintained through 48 weeks so the clinical effectiveness of benzodiazepine was independent of coeligibility for anti ig therapy also so this is my last slide and uh, i like to open up questions thank you Thank you, Dr. Manoj. A very informative talk. You can uh, stop the screen sharing. Yes, sir. A lot of uh, other trials, slides of trials, which could have been put, but because I know that most of them are just covering it, so I didn't discuss that. And I wanted to give time for more of a discussion and any questions which the audience would like to. Ask. The obvious question is the cost. I mean, how much do this cost? <laughs> okay. Yes, sir. So omalizumab. Will cost nearly ten thousand per vial. It has to be given one to four, right? So if the patient is having suppose a weight of sixty to seventy and an IG of five hundred or so, it will come to around four injections. That is around forty thousand cost, right? Uh, that is as per the MRP. If we buy directly, then it is eight thousand or so. So eight for the thirty-two. Mepolizumab, the cost is around sixty-five or seventy thousand, but they give one plus one free. And that is the MRP again. So if we go by the patient support program which they have, then they give on the PTR, and that comes to around thirty thousand per month. Same for benzodiazepam also. So benzodiazepam, the cost of the injection MRP is two point two five lakh rupees, and they have to buy the first one. Again, in the patient support program, if it is given directly at PTR, it is one lakh eighty thousand. So the patients, if we calculate by the lowest rate, one point eight, one lakh eighty thousand, then they have to buy the first one. Then they will get the treatment for the next six, uh, the other six months. That is the first six months they will get three injections. After the seventh, uh, after the when they take the fifth injection, they will get two more. So the average cost again for benzodiazepam will come to thirty thousand per month. So if it is a medical patient, we bill them either two lakhs or twenty five thousand. So the problem is only one thing that initially the medical claim used to reimburse. Now they have put in a, some clause that only 25% of the sum assured can be given. So we need to give the patient on PTR only, no cost, no profit benefit. But third, but uh, those on? you can approve. Doctor Manu, this this goes on for how long? I mean, so sir, theoretically they say we have to continue for long, but. i have been a very aggressive in treating asthma patients and diet control identification of the allergens pulmonary rehabilitation that increase just physical exercise for 20 to 30 minutes per day most of the days right these 
helps to control the patient's asthma very well with or without balance. Even before the balance came, I could control the patients, right? Psychological factors are, play a huge role. So if you uh, allow me, I'll just give two examples of good asthma control, even without biologics. One lady was having asthma since long and always moderate to severe PFT, right? And she had been coming to me for nearly eight to 10 years. She had taken homeopathy, Ayurvedic and everything. And she was never compliant, but she was comfortable. So it chal raha And high dose ICS lava was used, Montelukas, Fexofenid and everything was used. During COVID, she had a, a, a telephonic consultation and reported to me, I'm okay. Couple of months back, uh, three, four months back, she came to me. So we said to me, let us do the PFT. Surprisingly, the PFT was fantastic. So I asked her, when, since when she's getting better, she's feeling better. So she said she's feeling better since about one and a half years or so compared to the earlier times. And she has decreased the inhalers. So I went to the details. So there were two things which happened. One is her uh, mother-in-law, who was always sick, had expired. Right? So she was already under the tension of serving her. Second, her son was not getting married. And he got married about one and a half years back. So these two factors happened. So such cases, the psychological factor was playing a huge part. These two factors went away. Uh, it was surprising for me also that a patient having moderate to severe obstruction for a long time is now having just mild obstruction on P P uh, PFT. So even if the patient reports good symptom control, but a subject, a objective evidence of good lung functions was really there that the patient's lung functions improved. So what was happening in such cases? Possibly, despite all the medications, she was having micro aspirations because of her anxiety anxious attitude. She improved. Another lady was one of the first patients which I saw 20 years back. She was asthmatic, uh, mainly seasonal asthma throughout her life, right from the time she got married. Her sons tell me that she was always admitted and she was used to be given alcohol, wine, whenever there was an exhibition because that exhausted all the other resources. Right? <laughs> That lady, after all the proper control, since last 10 years, she's having, she requires inhalers only for two months in a year, that is September and October. Rest of the 10 months, she's off inhalers. What was the reason? Possibly poor control. Again, G reflux and anxiety. All these things require to be treated. And antibiotics. We go on giving antibiotics routinely. We don't do bronchoscopy in asthma patient. I do bronchoscopy in asthma patient, and some patients have secretions which never come out. You remove them, they grow something, you give the drug as per the sensitive report, and the patients have a fantastic response. Right? So, uh, third case, I would this is very interesting. Again, patient not responding to treatment. This is again goes back to around 18 years, 19 years back. Always having eosinophilia, did a bronchoscopy. Removed pseudom, uh, sputum, uh, sorry, uh, secretion, which was having, he showed pseudomonas, given treatment, his eosinophilia went away, his asthma went away. So, uh, infection, nidus in the lung was causing his exacerbations, repeated exacerbations, and he was just treated like asthma. Okay, so thank these you. These are some no. of the interesting cases. Yes, yes. I, we all understand that better management of asthma, sticking to the fundamentals, will also reduce this so-called difficult to treat asthma. Yes. Sir. Uh, there are some questions in the chat box. Uh, quickly, we'll take one by one. Yes. Sir. Uh, Dr. Sulin has few questions like, uh, what about reduction in ICS afterwards in terms of yes. episodes and so, please. Okay. So, sir, a patient, once they are on biologics, they try to reduce the ICS themselves. I personally tell them not to do so unless we have proper as he was, uh, the spirometry values which have improved, right? And uh, I would say no, but patients usually try to reduce them by themselves. Ideally, we should not decrease the ICS and lava. Okay. Uh, there are two, three questions which can be combined together. One of them is from Dr. Kiran Sa also. So there are few patients who would not respond to biologics. Yes. As a corollary to that question is, who are the patients who would not respond to uh, you know, biologics? So, as I discussed in my uh, talk, the lady who was not compliant to the other this thing uh, advice. So, 
whatever you give biologics or steroids or whatever a patient who is going to be exposed to the allergen is going to have the exacerbation right so you have to be away from the allergen number one psychology i give a few examples reflux is a huge cause some of these patients are having actually hypersarnia which will be detected only on a ct scan patients will be having the patient may be not be not be physically active so they have got impacted secretions so some of the patients of asthma and cpd actually have exacerbation during rainy season or during winter not because of viral infections or other things but because their life which was active they become more sedentary the secretions are there and they cause lead to exacerbations or about non eosinophilic uh, category uh, non eosinophilic yes. yes. so yeah so there is a neutrophilic that is th low you uh, asthmatic so these patients are having repeated infection so these patients again will require antibiotics where we can give azithromycin for a long time number one number two all these patients require bronchial toileting so exercise exercise and exercise right sirf chalne se fayda nahi hai they most of the patients hum chalte aadha ghanta not that a little more exertion exercise where the secretions can come out they can use help of a pulmonary rehab person a physiotherapist who can ask them to do uh, chest drainage uh, techniques okay so these are the patients again if the patient is not responding to all these things there has to be something else something else is some other disease uh, about pediatric patient there is a question regarding whether they are approved i saw that about 12 years yes sir uh, almost no can be given some of the experts in our you know pediatric fraternity also recommend and use them i have not personally used but uh, there is one dr jagdish chinappa he is around he is a respiratory yes, specialist in uh, our uh, fraternity pediatric yes sir so, jagdish if you are there kindly comment yes, on use of biologics in pediatric practice yes sir in pediatric practice two biologics have been uh, tried the first one is omalizumab has been mentioned and uh, slowly the age uh, is try they are trying to relax the age to about 6 years of age uh, we have personally used in a few patients uh, only about 12 years of age and as the criteria which dr manoj mentioned of both uh, you need a high eosinophil count high ige and on body weight so those uh, are the situations in which we have used now if you look at the newer literature mepolizumab has been used in quite a few patients especially reports have come from the uk and us on use in older children who have got certain criteria for uh, usage so these are the two in two drugs which have been used about the third drug which was mentioned by dr manoj i do not have any uh, experience in the studies which have been looked at in pediatric at least thank you jagdish the other for two points if i may ask right now if with your permission dr pandya yes yes sure please go ahead we have time so, so i think uh, the three comments i had that was a wonderful lecture and a very good experience of his uh, such, such a i mean to track these patients for such a long time is really remarkable and to look at their individual refer this the, the only one thing which i wanted to understand from him is one is he mentioned that one of his patients had three times allergy testing done it was all giving different reports yes sir no i think i think allergy testing is a very important thing because many of these patients may benefit from desensitization especially the ones which have got seasonal allergies uh, and who have got let's say multiple allergies so what what is your comment on that So I will yes, stop sir. with this question. I will ask the other two questions subsequently. Yes, sir. So allergy testing, those who have followed the patients and such patients actually throw more light on the validity of the allergy testing. So my approach is, I ask the patients to use their own common sense to know what is the cause. And after six months, if they are not able to find, then only I ask them to get an allergy test done. And from that, if there are few things. which they are allergic to we try to stop them we ask i give them a peak flow meter and tell them to stop the thing which is shown in the report and then see whether it is helping the problem with allergy report sir is that even if your and mine allergy report is done will be shown to have allergic to at least four five things and most of commonly the common house dust right but rest of the food allergens and all these things they help in a very few few cases most of my case over the last 20 years i have seen very hardly like i would say less than a dozen people may have benefited with allergy report testing so suppose a patient having uh, coming from africa having asthma since a long time we did the allergy report for her it turned out to be wheat we stored wheat she was off inhalers 
two years later she again came back with the symptoms she had already started inlers in africa this time we tested again for allergy test this time it was rice we stopped rice she again got better so in such selected cases i would do allergy test but not as a blanket uh, investigation for all the patients thank you sir patient, hey, allergy testing dr manoj you mean specific ig right or no, screen no 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 ig no, no not ig specific ig the, specific ig specific ig but that endocrine lab wala hai na sir no no not yeah. that one not that one that's ah, that's no, no, specific na no, sir that is with the fediotop is actually very costly and very selected uh, things are done if you want to done skin testing is would be much better but okay so you, you, you depend standard. more on skin prick test right no sir i have not done i actually don't uh, i have not done in, in any patient these no, no, what kind of patient, allergic test you recommend uh whenever i am in doubt i send to the endocrine lab in frustration only frankly no no that is that is rubbish actually yeah we yeah ask for okay. specific in pediatrics we do ask for specific ig like egg egg or uh, no uh, peanut or certain common milk protein allergy you know these are three four <laughs> things that we ask for and there are panels yeah, the most huh, the these most common allergy specific and, and the yes, experts recommend skin prick test if they are you know, actually planning immunotherapy then skin prick test is the best yes sir. dr jagdish can throw some light on this yeah i so, think i think now the allergy testing is getting more and more refined right mm-hmm. now we have got a new advanced allergy testing which will test the individual uh, immunogens in every allergic uh, component like for example if you look at the house dust mite it has got five different uh, antigens to which it can produce an allergic response and each patient may do his allergic re- uh, allergy very differently and one of those allergens in the house dust mite is very well correlated with wheezing and allergic rhinitis so i think the the testing is very get, getting more sophisticated i'll be expensive but if a patient is going to spend a huge amount of money for biologics uh, maybe an initial uh, proper allergy testing will uh, help in uh, looking at a cheaper alternative of desensitization you know? so this may be one point which we need to consider somewhere in at least in some sub group of patients at what sir mentioned so i think that is one thing and in children we have been looking right now and we have looked at a high incidence of uh, house dust mite sensitization cockroach is another major thing and the other third thing which is often missed in practice is the allergy to fungus especially in the in the walls in the damp walls and yes. you know, the, the, that is a very very serious condition because i have seen even hemoptysis happening because of allergy to a uh, uh, fungus growth in the house so sir in the management of asthma when i say about environment food and everything all these things come into that and Correct. most of the patients as a part of the clinical history i have to ask them whether they have got damp walls most of the patients have so what to do about that either they do treatment or i ask them to have an exhaust fan so at least the air circulation is there now the unfortunately in most of the modern houses there is no vent which was earlier there in the old days house kya bolte hain usko uh, roshandan mm. right above the uh, above the main door or above the windows when you like this is that huh, <clears throat> then it helps a lot and apart from this i ask uh, if you can see this like this is like a peak flow chart is it visible sir yes no. yes so uh, only way, it is it is a little dim uh, okay so it is just a chart of patient measuring their peak flow every day and writing what they had so how does help it is much more it has helped my patients more than the allergy testing so some patients will be allergic to specific things when they write down they come to know and it has helped frankly speaking allergy testing overall has not helped much peak flow and monitoring their own peak flow and writing down has helped and we have been able to manage patients better as you said allergy testing is getting refined so possibly i may then shift the practice to testing them more often yes Once it is Manoj, available because we old timers do not believe in allergic testing and immunotherapy but it's a science yes. which is very rapidly progressive and there yes, are sir. there is a section of patient who will definitely benefit so we yes, need to keep our mind Thank open you, to that dr yes. jagdish you wanted to ask few more questions i believe uh, if there is if there is one. time if there is time i will ask this five minutes questions. more Five minutes more. Then we yeah. Close. So quickly, I will ask two questions. One question is this: uh, you know, in patients who don't respond, one of the tests done is specific Ig for uh, aspergillus. Yes, so, uh, how often do you check that, sir? I check for each and every patient who is not responding. So I do CBC, ESR, Ig as a routine for all the patients. 
then give the treatment uh, as per the step 3 or 4 no, or 5 no, no, manoj he is asking uh, for specific ig yeah. for aspergillus yes, not that, for yeah. the total ig no no no, no, no. what that's what i am coming to so first we did ig if it is high then we and the patient is not responding then i go for as well specific ig okay so, sir thank you thank you <laughs> the third third and last question or which i wanted to ask actually i have two more questions but i will stick to one only and uh, that is um, <laughs> sir in my practice i have seen that um, much of the incidence of asthma has increased after the use of sunflower oil in cooking because if you look at the omega 6 to omega 3 ratio in sunflower oil the omega 6 is very very high compared to omega 3 compared to our traditional groundnut oils so how do you look at this as a as one of the aggravating factors in asthma because i tell all my patients to get off sunflower oil if they are asthmatic Actually, sir, what I uh, I'm, I don't know about this sulfur oil uh, uh, correlation with asthma, but overall, all my patients I ask them to stop chana or besan, right? That is one of the most common allergen, and most of the patients who has come to me with exacerbation, they say they had something which was having besan or chana. Even after six years of not been on treatment, they come with an exacerbation. They said they have pani puri khai thi aur usme chana tha. And for so many years they had avoided it. So in peanuts in America, chana in India is important. Many people, I have been of this opinion since many years, and all my patients, it is actually written in my prescription that chana besan please nahi khana hai. And I have correlated all these years. It is a fact, right? Second is oily food, fried foods. They have to be off that or decrease it. All processed foods, they have to be off that, especially those who are having repeated cough and repeated exacerbation. A number of pediatric patients who are referred to me for only cough and having inhalers, I ask them strictly to stop their uh, wafers and curcumin, and everything. And trust me, they are off medications. They are off medications. So I think uh, this food allergy and all that is a separate subject in itself. And there's a, lot of the, there's a lot of subjective, I think, uh, you know, approach from various clinicians. As far as I am concerned, I always go by studies and, you know, specific IG study, if at all we are restricting. Because if you restrict too many things in the diet, then also there is a psychological issue also. So, so Dr. Jaddi, when you say this sunflower oil, uh, do you have any studies which have been published uh, yeah, if you if you look at if you look at some of the studies which have come from Australia, see the problem is uh, correlating uh, these uh, the basic science studies with clinical outcomes. Now it is very difficult to do a study double blind study of um, of sunflower oil versus groundnut oil in a in a diet. So if you look at the basic uh, uh, cytokine responses after sunflower oil or the composition of the sunflower oil, you look at the omega six component, which is extremely high which is a pro-inflammatory cytokine compared to omega-3. And you look at our traditional oils, they're all balanced between omega-6 and omega-3. So I tell all my patients that when you have an inflammatory condition in your body like asthma, taking a pro-inflammatory oil will only exacerbate it. So try to avoid a pro-inflammatory oil. And sunflower oil, if you look at it, it's uh, it's rampant now. Sunflower and safflower are the commonest oils used, which are being used now. Of course, uh, palm oil is the other one, uh, which, which, which is uh, the cheaper oil. But if you look at the oil part of it, I generally tell my patients, please do not use anything which has got a very high omega-6 to omega-3. I can send you some references for that also. Yeah, that would be welcome. Yes, you can share it in the group. So yes. what I suggest, in, I mean, what is in my mind is that we have two topics for future meetings. One is food allergy for someone, some expert to talk about it. And of course, this oil is always a burning issue. So we'll get some fun <laughs> to talk about you know, use of oils also. So with this note, I think we can end the meeting. It's 9 o'clock. Uh, Dr. Manoj, thank you very much for a very brief and crisp presentation on biologics, which aroused so much of discussion. And thank you all for active participation, especially Dr. Jagdish from Bangalore. So thank we, you. End thank the you here. Uh, we end the meeting here and we meet next Saturday morning again. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.